Good morning and welcome to another Three Men Weave college basketball show here, hosted by SBR. Obviously, it is a special one because we're talking March Madness. We are very, very excited. The games actually start today. First four. We've got some games on the docket, boys. Looking forward to it. But before we dive in too much, let's make sure to shout out sbrpicks.com slash March Madness URL at the top of the screen. There's a lot of there's a lot of info there, guys. I was just there surfing around a little bit. There's a lot of March Madness 101. There's some fun facts. And of course, also on the SBR site, there's picks, there's write-ups, a lot of extra resources, some goodies. So make sure to check that out. And while you're here, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, youtube.com slash SBR Sports. Matt, mute your phone. I just did. How dare you? Done. All right, good. Uh, yeah, yeah. Make sure to like the video and subscribe to the YouTube channel. We we certainly appreciate, as does SBR. Uh, guys, we're not going to do takeaways, but real quick, betting the NIT is hard. Sometimes you beat a line by eight points and you still lose. We're not going to be betting the NIT. So injuries don't matter. Injuries don't matter. They haven't mattered since the dawn of time, Jim. That's that's the. <laughs> there we go. Uh, all right, let's let's get into the outline, guys. Why why beat around the bush? There's a lot to get to. Let's start. At the top, LSU versus St. Bonaventure, the 8-9 game in the East region. Kind of a, a very talented team versus maybe the well coach team. I think LSU got a lot of love after their great performance on Selection Sunday against Alabama, played down to the wire. St. Bonnie's, though, played pretty well that day, too, and for people that were actually checking out CBS. Matt, I know you're a Bonnie's guy, but I'm going to start with Kai because I'm curious as to what he's thinking here. Man, Jim, I'm back and forth like crazy on this game. I still think LSU is slightly underseeded. Um, I have thought the resume was good enough to get a six. But gosh darn it, Matthew, if your bodies aren't a tough matchup for LSU, I think they are. Um, I, I'm leaning towards the stars here. Watford, Smart, Thomas, all guys that can that can score. Um, all of them that are right, a, a college basketball star. You just kind of have to trust Mike Schmidt over Will Wade. The Bonnies dominate the glass, Matthew. I've been leaning LSU one day, Bonnies the next. Just help set me straight, maybe. I can't. I'm still torn in this game, too. And that's coming from the Bana, the Bana bandwagon conductor. I just think LSU, I'm with you. They are undervalued. I think they've been disrespected the last month. Um, that said, I'm not looking to bet against Mark Schmidt with this much time to prepare. I, I fully expect St. Bonnie to be ready to attack whatever defense LSU throws out there. Uh, we've talked about how they've been playing more man-to-man, and it's actually been moderately competent uh, after basically – forfeiting the defensive side of the ball for the last two years. So it's good to see Will Wade finally weaponizing the illustrious athletes that he has. I just think the Bonnies are just well-equipped to execute in the half court against their man. And if they go zone, I mean, Oshun Oshuni is a phenomenal high post passer. They have great cutters, guys who can make shots. They're just well-equipped to score with whatever LSU throws out there. And I trust them to defend LSU on the other end, Jim. There's this conception that Bonnies isn't as athletic as LSU. I don't, I think it's a lot closer than people think. Yes. They're, they're good athletes. I mean, they really are. It's not like this, you know, unathletic, um, you know, like Catholic youth league or whatever. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, that's, I, I think, a, a very great point. People just think of Bonaventure and A10 and, and, yeah. and Mark Schmidt, and they're like, oh, yeah, they're, they're going to be outclassed. I, I don't really think so. The, the concern for me, and I will be backing Bonaventure here, is just foul trouble. They, they play five, five and a half guys. Vasquez is the only one that really gets off the bench extensively, and specifically Shun in the paint. I mean, he's the big reason that their two-point percentage defense is so good. They, they force teams to shoot over the top. And if he gets in any foul trouble against Watford, then that's, that's major, major issues for St. Bonaventure. But I think he'll be able to avoid it. I'm hoping that they will let the boys play, considering it is the postseason. Um, so, I, yeah, I'm a Bonaventure guy. I, I've mentioned a couple times that Schmidt just prepared for one Shaka Smart assistant for a week against VCU, and they you know, got up 15 on them and ended up winning fairly comfortably. And now he's preparing for another one, Will Wade, and has another right. week to prepare. Yeah. So I think that's that's a, a nice little angle there. I will be on the Bonnies. All right, Kai, let's go to another one near and dear to our hearts here. Yes. Oklahoma versus Missouri. The other 8-9 nine, nine game on Saturday, so in the West region. Big news yesterday. Davion Harmon announced out for Oklahoma starting guard. The on-off splits are actually uh, pretty stark for him. Yeah. The offense is much better when he's on the floor. Having a second initiator with uh, alongside Austin Reeves really helps. So that could be the difference maker here. I was leaning towards Oklahoma because of the matchup before, some of the things that Lon Kruger's team does. 
But without Harmon, I think I am going to back Mizzou, Kai. Am I crazy? No. Just like LSU, Mizzou's underseeded. Plain and simple. Uh, the Harmon, uh, him being out, it does does sway me towards our Tigers, Jim. Line has come down to plus one. Um, OU and Mizzou both have kind of proven they can play with anyone. OU even with injuries. I mean, without Reeves and Manic, they still beat very good teams this season. Lots of Q1A wins between the two. I still love Drew Smith guarding Austin Reeves, Matthew. I think it's a great matchup. Yes, I agree. I give him trouble. Tillman has a huge advantage inside. Manic has a huge advantage pulling him out to the perimeter. It'll be kind of a cat and mouse game from that aspect. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to be on my Tigers. It's March, and my Tigers are finally back in the tournament. So I have to back uh, old Mizzou here. I hate to say this. I think the whistle will really determine this game. Um, you know, both teams are solid at getting to the line. Uh, I guess I should say their key players are good at drawing fouls. So, I mean, Austin Reeves, we talked about how he's so crafty at getting to the lane, drawing contact. Uh, we've seen Mizzou be burned by, you know, loose whistles with the way they aggressively defend sometimes. I, I think that's key. I think they have to be smart early, prevent foul trouble. You don't want to gift OU trips to the free throw line. I think their offense can get a little stale, a little stagnant if you just make them, you know, make first shots. You don't want to give them second chances on the glass. You don't want to foul them and give them trips to the charity stripe. So just play smart, sound defense as Mizzou, you know, usually does. Uh, I think they'll, they'll be fine here, especially without Harmon. I just didn't mention the, the on-off numbers are pretty stark uh, in terms of what his impact means. Yeah, the two matchup things that, that scare me both ways, I guess. One, if Manic plays the five for Oklahoma, and he will for long stretches, Oklahoma can run some pick-and-pop stuff that's just going to destroy Mizzou. Um, he, he's going to get in space. He's going to get open shots. That scares me. But on the other end, Jeremiah Tillman, Oklahoma doesn't have good post defenders. He could absolutely eat inside. I think he's maybe the top three in the entire country in efficiency as a pick and roll roll man. He's just a yeah. terrific finisher coming down the lane. So I think that is a good route to offense for Mizzou. There's a, this one's going to be interesting. It's kind of an X and O's battle, and I tend to lean Kruger there, but uh, the, the Harmon thing is what is what swung it for me. Yeah, Jim, just real quick, it, I hadn't even noticed that Kirchhoff, the big shot blocker for OU, who I would consider a good post defender, has basically been phased out of the rotation. Only played five minutes against KU yeah. uh, last game of the year. Um, so that means Manic will have to guard Tillman on the post too a little bit. And I think Tillman is a good passer if they double. So, yeah, m- multiple avenues for Mizzou to score here. Yep, yep. All right, let's go to the next game, guys. And this one, honestly, is the one I've had the hardest time with in the entire first round, particularly from a spread perspective. That is... Creighton versus UC Santa Barbara, 5-12 game. People obviously are always scoping for the upset here. Creighton coming off a nightmare performance in the Big East Tournament Final. Just got absolutely destroyed by Georgetown. Yeah, Matt, what are you looking at with this one? I mean, I think Ajari Sani actually practiced yesterday, starting guard for the Gauchos, so they're closer to full strength, maybe full strength, in fact. Do you think they get it done against Creighton? I'm a little bit concerned. I was leaning Creighton. Uh, sort of going against the early steam. The spread is sitting at, is it six right now? My, my seven and a half. Seven, seven and a half. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. I thought it touched six a little bit. So there's been some uh, pushback. Oh, very and a half. briefly did on like Monday, Tuesday. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I was looking to hop in on Creighton at six. I, I, I missed that. I just think that USCSB Kai is as athletic as Creighton. There's, I mean, this is basically a power six talent caliber team versus Creighton. And so Creighton's edge is really, you know, maybe you could argue coaching shooting um and just execution although we've seen that be a little bit disjointed at at times down the stretch i'm still a believer in creighton i'm a i'm a subscriber to the fact that they got a little bit apathetic complacent with some uh, small injuries i think they just sort of lost focus took their foot off the gas knowing they're in the tournament knowing they're safe i'm betting on sort of a creighton explosion here um it's a bad matchup it's a tricky matchup but i do think creighton comes out and plays well no spread take for me but this is not a, uh, a spot i'm looking to bet on an upset uh, in my bracket. So I'll be advancing Creighton outright, but no bet for me. Uh, yeah, dangerous 12 seed here, obviously. Santa Barbara, probably one of the most popular upset picks in the first round. Uh, and Creighton getting the, the doors blown off them against Georgetown uh, recently was pretty concerning. I, I still think they're a really potent team here. Um, it's Greg McDermott's best defensive squad ever. Yes. Uh, we don't really talk about the defensive end, but it is their best defensive squad he's ever had in the Kim Palm era at any school. Um, but yeah, Matt, like you said, Santa Barbara's well coached. They have, they have high major size. They can definitely compete with Creighton. They're probably bigger than Creighton, uh, 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 center to point guard. Um, but I, I, I do love Creighton's offense. They can shoot the crap out of the ball. Zagorowski can be one of those March stars that we love to ride in this setting. 
I'm still going back and forth here, Jim. My number says I should take Creighton, um, but I, I just don't know yet. Yeah, I've been back and forth on this one too. I, to Matt's point on on a high major roster, it, the the starting five for Santa Barbara transferred from Oregon State, Oregon, Nevada, Pacific, and then they have a three four star recruit as the fifth starter. I mean, their, right. their team is pretty loaded. They got a Temple transfer on the bench, a Tapal transfer on the bench. Like it is super talented. Uh, I I think that team can give Creighton some problems. McLaughlin is is not as good as Zagorowski, but He's as important to his team, and he's he's very uh, strong himself at the point. So I'm still waffling on this one. I, I do not have a true recommendation. Let's move on. Next one, guys, right in that same little area of the bracket. Virginia versus Ohio. Guys, you guys aren't in Vegas yet. Virginia's not in the bubble yet. They have not made it to Indianapolis because of their COVID situation. They are still in a shutdown back in Charlottesville, and they will arrive tomorrow. Uh, just a day ahead of their Saturday night game. That's definitely giving a lot of people pause here. I think they're looking at Ohio as a potential upset. Virginia's low possession count certainly, uh, you know, exacerbates those concerns. Kai, with this one, I'm an Ohio guy. Are you with me? Yeah, Ohio's the pick. I'm advancing him in the bracket too, Jim. Virginia getting into the bubble late is huge. Um, We don't know if they have players out. Um, It hasn't really been said, but certainly a possibility with, with, the way the COVID tracing has been happening with certain teams. And Ohio can shoot the crap out of the ball, Matt. I mean, obviously, that's yeah. one of the keys to beating Virginia. Can you shoot? Ohio, resoundingly, yes. Jason Preston's awesome. And Ohio's played good teams close before. Look at Illinois. Beginning of the year, Ohio was right with them that entire game. Um, yeah, Ohio plus seven is a play for me, um, and I will be advanced in my, in my bracket that definitely wins every single year. Trust me. Yeah, we're so good at bracket. Pools. Yeah, we love office pull brackets for sure. <laughs> I guess it's the nice thing about not having a, a corporate job is that you don't have to have water uh, core discussions boy. about losing your bracket pool. Um, I, so I thought the opening number was, wasn't was that far off if you exclude the COVID thing. But we've learned that yeah. it's, you know, those situations are worth two, three points, even sometimes more. You adjust for that. I think the early steam has sharpened the line to what it should be. But then you look at the matchup angle, as you both mentioned, a stronger lean toward Ohio. And I think that's not capturing the current line. I'm with you, Kai. I would still take seven. Um, I hate getting in at this late in the game when you've missed uh, two points, two and a half points of value in some cases. But uh, the way they shoot, the way they execute, I and mean, they can get shots out of their offense too. It's not just a playmaking, you know, press to make shots from 30. They they, they really execute some sets. Uh, they can supplement their star power, their shot making with some uh, with some set plays. And I like that. Different types of ways to score. You have to have that against Virginia, who does not give up an inch on that side of the ball, Jim. Yeah, inside the arc, really, really tough to score there. But as you guys mentioned, Ohio can loosen that up with with some perimeter shots. So, and they're also really well coached. Jeff Bowles is a guy we are a big fan of, and he's got talent there. So, yeah, Ohio. There's still some seven and a half out there to be had. So make sure you're looking around and, and try to get that get that hook so you can win if it lands seven. Right. Uh, okay, guys. A game we are split on. Colorado versus Georgetown. There's a, a little dissension among the weave here. I will be, uh, come on, say I am the Georgetown backer of the group here, but I'm fighting against the market, apparently. This guy, this game has gone up from five to six. People are back in the Buffaloes here. Kyle, I'll start with you. What are you, what are you seeing in this one to give you a, a Colorado lean? The line movement shocks me. Um, I'm, I'd be surprised if most tickets weren't on Georgetown. So might, yeah. I might tell you that some of the good money is coming out in Colorado. Um, yeah. I, I like Colorado here. I'm mean, six is getting a little too high. I mean, sheesh. I think I made this game around seven, so it's still like within maybe a play for me. McKinley Wright, senior leader, point guard, uh, Tad Boyle, better coach than Patrick Ewing in my mind. Um, and Colorado Matt has the brawn to battle Georgetown's yep. size. I think the Hoyas are playing a little bit over their heads right now. Um, I, I like Colorado to get this one done. Yeah, I actually took first half uh, minus three. I think is what it currently sits at. So I would I would endorse that. Colorado has a propensity to blow leads. They don't really play well if they leave. We've seen them get out to hot starts. I think you take away the Georgetown potential second half comeback if they get down with the first half play. And you're also getting some of that value back that you missed with the early action on the full game. I just like three first half better than six full game, I guess. Bigger picture, though, um, Jim, you mentioned this. I, I think Colorado, to me, is undervalued by the numbers. But you could argue they're overvalued because I, they had a home, you, their, their home court advantage has been – um, something that's the that advantage has been amplified this season because of the elevation. Obviously, no one had fans, so I, I do think I'm cons- I'm concerned that I haven't fully accounted for that. 
I just think Colorado is a better team. I don't think Georgetown's that good. I know they had a crazy magical run. I'm just not buying it. I'm on the buffs here. Yeah, I, I kind of buy into Georgetown a little bit. They've won nine of their last 13 in the Big East. It's pretty solid. Not a ton of headlining wins, but they, they had a couple in that NCAA tur- or in the Big East tournament. That Creighton game was a, a massive statement. And yeah, Matt, you kind of alluded to it. Per Bartorvik.com, if you filter for only away and neutral games, so you take out that, that altitude advantage, Colorado's 35th, Georgetown's 37th now. They're, they're two spots away from each other. That would essentially dictate yeah. this game as a pick if you remove home court advantage. So I'm going to take the plus six here. I think Georgetown's length can bother Colorado here, and they can score a little bit inside with Wahab. So give me give me the Hoyas fighting you guys. Bring it on. Yeah, leave. get out of here. First half. Hey, full game, you'll win. First half, I'll win. We'll all be, we'll all be happy. We'll all see Perfect. Like Perfect. I'll hop Plus in. Plus, I'm Colorado, in which case. We'll see. Oh, yeah. sorry. Just be yeah. first we'll half. Okay. We'll we'll all right. Another one in that same region, guys. Uh, actually, no, not in the same region. We're going back up to the West. Oregon versus VCU. An Oregon team that we are definitely high on, but man, the market is two. We're looking yes. at a, a Ken Palm spread of one, but a actual spread of Oregon minus five and a half that has come down a hair from the opener of six, but I'm surprised it's lingered up there. I think this VCU team is very solid. They're well coached. The pressure to, against Oregon, maybe not the best route to go because they have good ball handlers. They have multiple ball handlers and they have big ball handlers that can see over the top and, and really you know, not get totally phased by that pressure. Matt, I, I this is just too steep for me to back Oregon. Yeah. I think the, anything over five is, is too steep for me to take them. I would lean towards VCU in the spread. I'm not going to bet that. I may throw Oregon in like a money line parlay. We, ne- we never really endorse parlays on the show, but I want to get Oregon advanced. They'll be advancing my bracket, so I'll figure out something there. What do you see in here? Major matchup advantage for Oregon, and the thing that really sticks out here is the fact that everyone seems to deb- or discredit the analytics that have this game closer to a pick, right? Oregon's ranked in the mid-30s in most of the analytic numbers, and VCU is right around there, too, implying this should be basically a coin flip type game. Yet we have an opening line of six, and it's basically hovered around that, down to five and a half in some places. So a little bit of pushback with VCU. But I, I just think people are, you know, we, we are, too, we're guilty of this as well. We have Oregon a lot higher in our minds. We think they're still undervalued because they haven't had all their pieces in there. But you look at the last month, they've had their full roster. They really haven't improved in those analytic rankings, Kai. So I'm a little worried that maybe we're... We're two. We're blinded by the quack quack, you know, allure or something. I'm not. I'm. I, I'm a little bit torn here. What do you think? I, I kind of agree with you. I, I made this line smaller than what it is. I made it around three. I made five points seems yeah. crazy for oddsmakers to open it up at this at this price. Um, but Oregon's really good, man. I think they have lead eight potential. Um, All American now, Chris Duarte, right? He's been fantastic yeah. this season. VCU's defense though, lockdown, 12th best in the country. I think the under might be a good play here. Um, I, the other one's just not great for either team. Oregon can't stop anybody. VCU, not not a great uh, offensive team. Jim, it's mainly a Dana Altman thing for me. Uh, I mean, I trust this guy in March. He he continues to win, 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 um, even as a lower seed. And, and this year, you know, uh, not not in the worst shape in the world at a seven. But still, I I have to lean towards Oregon. I still haven't decided if I'm going to back B, VCU though on the plus five. I, I think that's just a little bit too high. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Matt, that's that's all American Chris Duarte to you, who gave him second team all conference. How dare you? I feel rude about that. I need to <laughs> I need to go back and readjust that. Uh, so it, filtering, by me. Filtering Bartorvik for since since mid February, so by date, Oregon forty sixth. That's not very good. No, it's like you like you mentioned, no. Matt, this really haven't been that good. But VCU is fifty third, so it's not like they've been terrific themselves. Uh, obviously, Bones Highland injury has a little bit to do with that. I think VCU isn't really built to take advantage of Oregon's defensive flaws. They don't have anyone to stop anyone in the paint, but VCU doesn't play through the post at all, and they're going to struggle to get to the rim against the zone. So that that could be an issue. Okay, last one on the outline before we talk some chat mob. UConn and Maryland, guys, the 7-10 game down in the East region. UConn, obviously a, a team that a lot of people are interested in from public sense because of the James Booknight hype and just simply the, the brand UConn, a team that has made some big runs in March, particularly when led by an All-American star like this. But they face a Maryland team that has the Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year, Daryl Morsell. They're very switchable. Maybe feels like they're, they're a, a tad undervalued here. Kai, what are you looking at with this game? I, I did take Connecticut minus two on the early spread and 
I, I, I'm still concerned, though, even with R.J. Cole ruled uh, ready to play. He's play, yeah. It's it's kind of like the Georgia Tech thing, Jim, pre-Moses Wright, although I mean, that spread's gotten way too high. No one's on Maryland. I haven't seen anybody on Maryland, and that, that no. worries me. And This is not a bad team. I, Maryland's scrappy. They play very good interior defense, and that's against Big Ten teams with huge front courts like UConn has. I mean, they're not going to back down here because UConn's a little bit bigger. Matt, I just keep picturing in my head, though, James Booknight, one shining yeah. moment. He has that written all over him, yeah. and, and I can see him carrying this this team. Heck, I, I can see them making the Final Four as, as a flyer, UConn. Um, but this this is a challenging game for them, and I, I can see Maryland winning this game outright and kind of blowing up my bracket, but I am going with UConn minus three here. I'm so torn in this game. I think the one thing you have to look at is Daryl Morsell, Big Ten Defensive Player in the Year, perfect type of defender to throw on book night will he hold him down completely no but that's definitely the you got to feel good about that if you're a maryland backer here which i think amplifies the importance of rj cole playing book Knight's going to need some help from the supporting cast and he hasn't always gotten that this season it's usually book Knight needs to be hot or uconn needs to be dominating the offensive boards and while maryland is small they rebound right they gain rebound unlike oregon who has that sort of interchangeable multi-positional lineup around six six to six eight maryland has that but they actually get to the glass and take care of their business um Kind of with you. I'm just worried about the whole no one's picking Maryland. So are we completely writing them off? It feels like a game that they just went and shut everybody up and we're all like, oh, yeah, Maryland's probably actually better than we thought. Yeah, I, I, we, I think we made this comparison to the Louisville, Minnesota game from two years ago, 2019, 7-10. Where we were already like talking about the run that Louisville could go on out of that seven slot. And then they kind of got stomped by Minnesota yeah. in the first round. Yep. We just kind of neglected the Big Ten team. It was feisty. So I'm worried that that is the case here. I'm hesitant to advance Connecticut too far in my bracket just because I, I think they could go down in this one. So yeah. we'll keep an eye on that. All right, boys, let me uh, kick it to hopefully one of you has been monitoring the chat. Otherwise, there's 16 games. And, and only the rest. And, and really, there's only 12 games because four of them don't have an opponent yet. So let's, uh, Matt, any, anyone in high demand there? Uh, someone asked about UCLA Moneyline. Our boy Barry did no, not. We're not, talk- we're, we're not first four. Not talking this. We got a video uh, on this four already. Yes, there's a first four video. YouTube.com was... slash SBR Sports. There's a full video. We encourage you to check that out. We gave our takes in very, very perfect detail. Check that video out. Let's start with Kansas, Eastern Washington, guys. No Jalen Wilson. Yep. Uh, KU may be vulnerable because of that. Eastern Washington, though, in my opinion, they play no defense. It's not an opinion. That's a fact. They don't play defense, Matthew. I don't think they're going to stop Kansas. But they have a lot of shooting, and it's double digits. I do kind of lean their way uh, with that spread. Not that confident in it. I, I like the over here. Um, it's at 147 now. Wow, I'm really going to climb that high. It opened at 143. I feel like I'm a sucker taking it at this price. But there's no way Eastern Washington defends McCormick. Um, he's just going to dominate inside. But I also think KU struggles to defend Eastern Washington. They haven't had a legit practice you know, schedule this week. McCormick will basically only be there for one day. And he's actually the key defender against Eastern Washington's offense, which is all inside out through post type of action. Um, so you can see him looking lost in Eastern Washington, getting some back cuts, open kickouts for threes with what all the stuff that Chancey Leggins does there. Uh, I think it's a ton of points. No side take, though, for me, Jim. Yeah, I've, I've struggled with this one, too. Uh, this this and UC Santa Barbara Creighton are the two games I have no bet on yet. I, I, I try to get something on every game just for mostly for fun while we're out in Vegas. Some obviously more confident than others. I have not made my, my final ruling here. Uh, McCormick, to, to Harry R's question in the chat, he is back. He is entering the bubble today, Matt? Or, or he's going to be practicing on Friday. Um, he so arri- gonna- I thought he arrives to late tonight or tomorrow morning. So, yeah, he'll be practicing Friday, and then they play Saturday. So it's really one practice with him in there. Yep, yep. And so, yeah, no Jalen Wilson, but he could possibly return on Monday. We'll see what, what happens if they're able to pull this game out. I, I think they I, Kansas should win, but, yeah, I have no confidence on, on a spread here. Um, so currently staying away. Um, what else we got here? Got Iowa Grand Canyon. Iowa, 14 and a half point favorite, I believe, last time I checked. Yep. Uh, Lopes. I yeah, I, I'm going Lopes. back and forth here, Matthew. Grand Canyon can hang with their size, but I don't know. I, Iowa's got that blowout potential. They do. I just love Asborn Mitgard. He is the not perfect, but if any mid major team, you know, if you're Iowa, this is probably the one mid major in the 14 to 16 seed range that you did want to see because they have a, a, a great counter. For Garza, obviously Garza will still get his right, but I think that he you can he can hold his own and prevent the double triple teams that then lead to the kickouts, but then lead to the Iowa 15, 20 point three point you know barrage type games. 
And Bryce Drew, Jim controls the pace. I think they'll keep it somewhat low possession, and I think they keep it close enough to stay within 15. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I'm on Grand Canyon here. The, the mid guard not being able to just kind of be thrown around by Garza matters. And he's not, you know, he's not the same caliber defender as, as Coburn, but I don't think of Hunter Dickinson as particularly nimble or great post defender, but it's yeah. just the, the sheer size. The fact that he can't be bullied by Garza is, is clutch and hopefully will prevent them from having to double too much. So yeah, you kind of make Garza play more pick and poppy, which he's awesome in, but you at least take away one avenue of his, his scoring option. Yeah. The, the easier option really when the he's in the option, paint, yeah. he's a fantastic finisher as long as he's able to get to his spots. Um, all right, let's see what else. Florida state UNC Greensboro, Jim Knowles minus 10 and a half kind of talks about how FSU is just a bigger and better version of Greensboro uh, matchup lean towards Florida state, but I kind of love the idea of Greensboro as a double-digit dog. Um, they don't seem to lose many games by by more than that. Um, so, I'm, again, this is one of the toughest games to pick, in my opinion, from a spread perspective. Yeah, I, I kind of had some issues with it, too. Uh, I, I think Florida State ends up overwhelming them because they're, like you said, a little bit of a better version. I think you beat Florida State with execution, with patience, and, and shooting. And Greensboro's more athleticism and let's let's run at you isaiah miller fantastic and should have a couple fun dunks here because this game should be a little bit yeah uh, they'll, they'll get a couple steals against florida state's sometimes shaky ball handling but ultimately without the the shooting to really punish florida state in my opinion yeah uncg wins with size speed athleticism in their socon league with isaiah miller being the uh, the exemplar of that he's just a high flyer uh trapeze artist he's so he can jump through the roof but florida state i mean you know, six nine, six seven, six eight, six nine, seven foot with with uh, Co- uh, Balsa Coprica inside. I, mean, I don't think UNC Greensboro is going to score at all in this game. So, I'd be weary about taking them, Kai, at plus eleven. But I do think they're feisty enough to hang around. Yeah. Uh, Texas and Abilene. Uh, this spread's gotten steam for Texas a bit. Minus nine now. Texas bloodbath for me. Too much size. Too much athleticism. I'm I'm going Texas. Yeah, I agree. As long as they take care of the ball, you can see Texas's guards, you know, laying an egg. They have a propensity to just sort of get in their own world, take dumb shots, cough up the the basketball, and and a- ACU will make you pay for all of that. But I think if they just don't throw away possessions, uh, I think Texas wins pretty easily. Yeah, that's I mean that's the concern. You know, Abilene Christian, one of the best ball pressure teams in the country, number one defensive turnover rate. Texas guards definitely can be shaky at times. And Abilene Christian plays through the post, like one of the highest rates in the entire country. And you're not you're not going to beat Texas with size. I mean, you can absolutely destroy a lot of mid-major, small-major teams, well-major Southland, but it, it just doesn't work against Texas. So I, I initially looked at this and wanted to love the dog. And I think there are some like upset giant killer models that like Abilene Christian here. I saw John Ezekiewicz for uh, Wall Street Journal had a good article about it, but I just I think Texas overwhelms them, like I said. Yeah. Wow, Chat Mob loves Texas as well. That's a that's an all the way around consensus, fellas. Weavers and mobsters. Good to Great see side. that. Yeah. Great side. That's Love good. that. Uh Alabama versus Iona's last game here, guys. Sixteen and a half. Wow. Uh huge spread, but big number. Jim, I don't know if Iona can really score. Uh, Alabama number two in defense in the country. This Iona team is not good because of its def- or excuse me, because of its offense. Um so, yeah, I don't know. I lean Alabama. I think they should be a 16 seed Iona anyways. Yeah, I, I actually like Iona here. Um, I think their defense is good enough to frustrate Alabama's offense, which is its weakness at this point. Um, but, yeah, I think you're, you, you've kind of talked me into that. Uh, I'm less confident in it now because of the fact that Iona's offense is probably going to struggle quite a bit here. I mean, they couldn't yeah. score against MAC defenses. Now they face one of the top five in the country. So that is a worthy point. Yeah, Iona, they, they run some tricky back cuts. Like, Patino's, he talked about how he's, like, implemented some European-style offense from his time in Greece. And you can kind of see it when you watch them play. They, they get some some easy cuts and action that'll, you know, take the pressure off their relatively limited offense. But I worry that they're going to cough up the ball here. And against Alabama, you get them some momentum in transition. There's no team that'll, that'll put you in the hurt locker faster. I did take Iona. Sorry to clarify. Oh, Iona's a small way. bet for me. <laughs> Iona's a small, that, small bet. That's all small the games. The rest are, are that's picks, it? Jim. Yep. So waiting on Gonzaga's opponent. I, I, you know, hard to bet that game, even when we know the opponent, just because it really comes down to Gonzaga's mindset. They're, they're leaps and bounds better than whoever they're going to play. Yeah. If they want to win by 40, they can. Otherwise, they could just be complacent, win by 20. So uh, keep an eye on that. 
Michigan versus Mount St. Mary's, Texas Southern. That one, you really have to know who they're playing because those two teams are so different stylistically, Texas Southern and Mount St. Mary's, that it's going to be a very different matchup. So keep an eye on who wins there. Uh, We can probably give our thoughts on on Twitter or something once the outcomes are decided today. Michigan State, UCLA against BYU. A lot of models like the upset there. Not as into BYU as Mr. Matthew is. Matt, tell them why they should believe in BYU. Because BYU is good, Jim. They have an awesome coach, and they're playing well at the right time. And I don't get this whole UCLA Mich- Michigan State infatuation. I maybe Michigan State could give them some trouble, but I think UCLA gets run out of the building by BYU. So BYU is a dark horse to win this region. I think it's worth a a, a regional future taste if you have some extra coin laying around. I don't agree with this take, but I I think okay. Michigan State is going to beat BYU in, in the first round here. I'm sorry, right. Matthew. Very and Texas st- will beat BYU too. So I I don't see BYU getting past. That's a tough draw. Like Texas tough tough matchup. That's fair. Very similar stuff with USC. Uh, another huge team in the front court, not quite as strong in the guards. I mean, I actually like uh, BYU's guards more than I like USC's, which maybe I don't know if that's controversial or not, but. Uh, it's a tough matchup for Wichita or Drake, whoever advances, because they're not going to really be able to score inside against Evan Mobley. Neither team is super prolific from downtown, so can't really loosen up the USC defense. Probably would lean USC there. Hey, um, Jim, as a Mac perspective, I have this thought in my head right now that the Big oh, sure. Ten is going to underperform and everyone's going to get screwed. And the Pac-12 is going to play really, really well. Yes, and I agree. USC, Oregon goes far. Oregon State wins. Uh, pandemonium. Uh, I don't know if it's going to happen, but... Preach. I have this strange inkling that Big Ten just underachieves. How about that Col- for a call? Why oh, not? Throw no, no, no. up. Calls. No one's going to call you out on it. There might Col- be. A, I bet okay. there's a prop somewhere of total wins by the Big Ten, and yeah. if if there if you idea. can find, it, I don't know if it's DraftKings or FanDuel or wherever it might be. Um, keep an eye out for something like that. It sounds like Kai would be into the under. Uh, yeah. I I could see that. I, I think I'd probably be with him. So, all right. I think that is it for today. Again, folks. We have a video on the youtube.com slash SBR Sports channel breaking down all the, the first four games today. There's also a video breaking down all the Friday games tomorrow. So if you missed those, definitely check those out. Also hit the like button on this particular video and subscribe to the YouTube channel. You'll get all the notifications you need when new videos are out. And lastly, check out sbrpicks.com slash March Madness URL, top of the screen. A lot of great info there. Also other picks and write-ups on their site. We always love uh, plugging our, our friends at SBR. So thank you, everybody in the chat, for coming today. We will talk to you on Sunday morning, bright and early, to talk about the round two games. So we will see you guys then. Until enjoy the first weekend. It's great to have it back.